Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very, very excited because we have a very special guest, and her name is Ashley Pokler. She is an amazing um, person, and she has education in psychology. She works with children, and she does a lot of nonprofit work, and today she's really um, passionate she's about children, and today she wanted to speak about um, community of care and bringing um, communities together to build a health healthy, um, productive community for children so they could live a healthy and stable life. And she's going to talk a little about what community of care actually is and what it means and how people can actually get involved so they could actually help children and help parents together become one and grow together and have healthy, stable lives. So, you know, Ashley, today's an honor to have you on the show. I think this is a great topic. I think it's very important for people to um, know, understand the importance of bonding together, not pointing the finger at each other, but really taking responsibilities for our actions, understanding when we make mistakes because we're human, everybody makes mistakes, and then just trying to fix those mistakes and improve ourselves and improve our lives with our children so we can keep that common bond and we can grow healthy and stable lives together. And so, you know, tell everybody a little about yourself and, and what you do. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Stacey. Um, so I work in two different spaces. I work in the private practice space um, through actually a pediatrician's office um, and then in the nonprofit space. And in the private practice space, um, I do a lot of work with parents on just understanding their child, understanding what's developmentally normal and appropriate, and then what may need some extra support. And as I'm sure anybody with children knows, children don't exist in a vacuum. The family determines a lot of what's happening with the child, but so does the school and the community. And that's really where that community of care idea and approach came from, is this idea that parents, good enough parenting is good enough. Same in the teaching space, um, same in the community. And what happens is um, all of those places work in silos and they're not communicating with one another. And when things go wrong, they're quick to blame each other. I've worked in schools, I've worked as a therapist. I am a parent of four kids. And, it, and it's easy to say, oh, it's the school's fault or in the school, oh, it's the parent's fault. But I've seen that when we all are working together with that child at the center and what's best for the child being at the forefront of all of those conversations, instead of being against each other, we can partner um, and the outcomes are so much better for the child. And that leads into the nonprofit space where we really focus on child sexual abuse um, and sex trafficking. And that community of care is so important there too, because a child gets taken out of the only community they knew in that moment, placed into a new one, often with parents who don't know how to talk about what happened, often with schools that the parents aren't even sharing what had happened because they're worried about judgment. And so really looking at how has this trauma impacted this child, what behaviors are tied to the trauma as opposed to the child being a bad child, and how can all those systems at play, those adults that care for and care about that child, support that child in a way that is beneficial and that builds upon each other? I think that's wonderful. You know, you you cover a lot of areas. Like, what brought you to this this specific you know um, passion? You know, because you really you, you you when you speak, you could see that you have a passion. You really care. And um, you know, you've taken action to make you know your passion actually become a reality. So you know what exactly you know made you have this drive that you know to get you to where you are today. So I actually worked in alternative schools. I was a special education teacher first, and I found myself in high school settings for kids who were kicked out of their home schools for again, quote unquote, bad behavior. Um, yeah. And what I found was that all of those kids had a trauma history. All of those kids were facing significant difficulties that made learning not the priority. And right. in that space, I saw how broken a lot of the systems were. A lot of the kids went through the foster system. A lot of the parents wanted what was best for their child, but didn't know how to provide it. They, they were doing the best they could with what they had, but they were being vilified by the school because the school was saying, just do this. And the parent was either completely against that idea because of their own experiences or unable to do what the school was asking. Um, and so I had my oldest daughter actually, 
and I wasn't sure I could be the parent I wanted to be and the teacher that I was for these uh, 10 high school kids with very significant emotional needs. And I went back to school for my master's um, and I was going to stop, <laughs> I was, um, but I couldn't advocate for my clients. I was doing my internship at a juvenile detention center. I had some of my old students there, which highlights that pipeline. Um, yeah. And I was meeting with kids on a weekly basis and giving um, feedback to the psychiatrist and she wasn't taking any of my feedback. And I had a conversation with my supervisor and she made it very clear that I did not have the right letters after my name to advocate for my clients in the way that I wanted to. So I went back for my doctorate so I could have the letters. And because that was the reason that has become my driving force. What changes can I make? How can I use my the privilege of my education and the the power of those letters to make yeah. long lasting changes for as many children as possible? Which is why I look at the community as a whole instead of each individual child. Wow, that's some story. You know, I I, I understand exactly where you're coming from because why you know we think about it. Over seventy percent of the families in the United States come from dysfunctional families. And when you go into the school systems, they're taught for specific things, but they're not taught for a lot of things, unfortunately. And so when when things arise in the school system and, and children are acting out or they have behavioral issues or if they're, you know, if they're not doing well in school, immediately, you know, teachers will react in a negative way or they'll blame the parent or they'll, you know, or they just don't know how to help and they're, they're not given the correct help. And instead of helping the child, they're actually hurt in the child and they're causing more trauma for the child they're not even realizing it and then you you know if you have a parent that goes in and tries to talk to them you know sometimes you know these parents these teachers or these principals or these staff members or vice principals you could just tell by their body language that you know this is our rules this is the way it's going to be and that's that you know and they're not open to understand that each child is different each child has different needs and each child comes from a different family and has different issues that need to be addressed a specific way. And, and until we, like you said, until we become one community and we start understanding that and we work as a community, instead of pointing the fingers, we need to so somehow learn how to work together and understand that each child, if you're going to, if you're going to be a parent or if you're going to work in a school system or you're going to work in a setting where there is children in the area, you have to understand that each child is different and if they are acting out there is a reason for it because they don't come out of the womb with all these dif different problems they come into our environment and are, they are affected by the environment in which they live in what and so we have to understand what's going on and we have to need to, to address it in a caring loving manner because that's all they're looking for they're looking for people who care they're looking for direction they're looking for a way to improve because i'm sure if they have the opportunity to improve in some way or fashion they're going to you know but they need to develop that trust that bond that love and you know and and it's very hard to have that when you've been hurt as a child and then you go into a school system and the school system is not providing that that love and that care and that trust because they've never been taught how you know so it's just it's like a very dysfunctional cycle and then you have all these kids that grow up and they're kind of lost in society they're just totally lost and a lot of them get infected their whole entire life because it wasn't corrected in their childhood years yeah. how do you feel yeah exactly um it's actually Something I do with the private practice, besides meeting with the families, is I also provide feedback um, and consultation with schools. Because the reality is, I was taught some of that in the special education space, because that's our students. But in the general education teaching practices, they're not given the information about things like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the fact that if kids didn't have a good night's sleep and a breakfast, they're not going to be able to function in the classroom the way we expect them to. And the next level of that is psychological safety. And so yeah. uh, general ed teachers aren't taught some of these um, basic principles, which is actually kind of my tagline on my LinkedIn and things like that, bridging the gap between parenting, education, and psychology. There's, there's things that are just common knowledge in the psychology field that if yeah. we equipped parents and teachers with that knowledge, 
the outcomes for kids would be so much better um, because the view, the lens through which we view our own children or as teachers view our students would change. It would shift with that basic understanding. Yes, 100%, 100%. Now, if, if parents are, are dealing with children that are acting out and, you know, they, you know, some parents, you know, they, they see their child acting out and they don't realize that it could be caused by the setting in the home. You might have parents that yell a lot. You might have parents that are constantly fighting or, you know, if a child does something wrong, instead of, you know, talking to the child and explaining to the child what they did wrong and why it shouldn't be done that way, they immediately, you know, they just apprehend the child, you know, and, and then, you know, that's when, you know, problems start to arise and then children act out more because they become more angry because they're not understood, you know, so it's like, you know, in, in your, in your, from your own experience, you know, what are some ways that parents can, you know, start to develop a happy, healthy home environment, even, you know, and, and understand themselves that everything they do, everything they say is going to have a huge impact on that child, that tween, that teen, and it's going to go into their adulthood years. I'll start with the disclaimer that even I don't get this right all the time, even though I train <laughs> parents in how to do this. I have four kids myself. They're currently 10, 11, 12, and 14. So we're right in the midst of entering a teenager life. Um, yeah. But the the thing that I tell myself and that I tell the parents that I work with is that good enough parenting is good enough. Um, Donald Winnicott said that back in the, like the 50s or the 60s. And what it means is it's okay to make mistakes. A mistake right. here or a mistake there, losing your temper and yelling doesn't chart your child's entire life. It's when it becomes a pattern that it becomes problematic. And honestly, the best thing parents can do is to do your own emotional regulation. So when you're feeling that anger and that stress or that disappointment rising, take yeah. a few minutes to reset. Say, you know what? I need a time out before you and I have this conversation and go take the time. It's not, your child's not going to suddenly become a worse human being in that 15 minutes it takes you to come down. And then you can have a calm conversation when you're ready for it. And if it starts to heighten again, nobody's getting anywhere. As soon as we're heightened, um, in, in the field of child psychology, we say that uh, your lid is flipped. And so all of that um, cognitive thought, all of the decision-making, it's not happening anymore. So anytime that the discussion gets raised, end it and come back to it at a later time. Um, and I think that one change in and of itself can have ripples of effects in any difficult conversation or difficult topic that you have with your child, with your children. And I just wanna highlight one other thing I see often. Um, again, I live in that space of child sexual exploitation and yeah. there's a lot of kids who fall into the sex, the sex exploitation on, the, on uh, social media. And it really boils down to, they don't feel safe or comfortable coming to their parents with that, I sent a picture to somebody and now it's bad um, because there've been enough negative interactions that mom, dad, grandma, whoever the caretaker is, doesn't feel like a safe place to go to. Right. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah. I, I think, you know, a lot of times when we see these things happening, um, you know, uh, it's, it's really hard. It's a hard situation because, you know, I, I've seen so many, so many parents and, and children get so affected by the interactions in their homes. And you know, the one thing I like that you said, and I, I have used it and learned it over the years, but it took into my teen years to actually learn from somebody else is that when the conversation gets too heated is to back away and to walk away. And, you know, and if you can have that conversation, you know, try to have that conversation at a later date. But if you know that the person is going to react the same way, then you know what? Maybe you shouldn't have the conversation with that person and you should deal with someone who is a professional and learn how to cope with that situation or the feelings that you get when, you know, those type of things happen and just get those repressed emotions out, you know, learn techniques on how to deal with situations that if they arrise again. But, you know, it, you have to at some point going head to head with somebody is never the answer because it, it, nobody's going to win. You're heated. You're going to say probably things you regret. They're heated. They're going to say things they regret. At the end, both of you are hurt. At the end, both of you, you know, 
don't have a stable relationship. So there is nothing that benefits from two people just going at it. It's better, like you said, to take a step back and walk away and just, you know, clear your mind, clear your thoughts and think about, okay, what is the best way to do this? You know, and if you can't figure out the best way to do this, go to somebody you trust, like somebody who handles situations like this and, and is as knowledgeable that can give you advice and techniques and tools and how to really cope with this. Because these are things that are going to happen throughout life, you know, and not even with families, but it's going to happen in the real world too. I, again, this will probably stem back. I believe, you know, when we have, you see people that are dysfunctional, it's either because something traumatic happened during their lives or they came from an environmental setting that was dysfunctional. So this is all they know. This environment is normal to them. These behaviors are normal until someone says, hey, this is not right. And that's when the change starts. If the person is willing to change. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I definitely think that, um, so trauma definitely changes how people view the world and changes their understanding of the world around them. Um, so trauma in and of itself is uh, a catalyst for change. Um, but many, many kids that I've worked with, it's intergenerational. It's been um, dysfunctional for generations. And we call it dysfunctional, but at the base, at some point, it was an adaptive response to a, a, a difficult situation that has just become maladaptive over time. Um, a lot of the kids that I work with, um, fighting or getting aggressive keeps them from having to be vulnerable and vulnerable is scary. And so in, as a teacher or as a clinician, that looks like maladaptive behavior, but to the child and to their brain that is constantly working worried about unsafe situations, it's easier for them to cause a rift in the relationship before it even becomes a real relationship, um, yeah. like a self-fulfilling prophecy, basically. Adults aren't trustworthy. I'm going to prove it by pushing them to the point that they show that, they're, that they get angry and aggressive, too. Um, right. And, and I, I want to highlight, um, there's uh, some free downloads on uh, apoclarponders.org that go into how to have these kinds of difficult conversations with your child. So it, it, it covers some of the different ways of doing this. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that's great because I, I think, you know, a lot of times people, you know, have a hard time communicating with their children and, and, you know, you have to have, you have to be on the same baseline and, you know, you have a younger child that's thinking on a totally different level and you're at a different place in your life too. So you have to really put yourself back into that, that, you know, those childhood years or those teen years and, and think about how you thought, you know, and then have some compassion and some understanding. And I think too, I think the the key is to, you know, to have some compassion and to, and to be understanding and then, and figure out a solution in some sort. What's your feelings on that? Yeah, that goes back to really understanding the developmental norms of the child that you're, that you're working with. So um, a lot of parents struggle with the teen reactions to social things, to taking away their phone, to not letting them go somewhere. And the reality is, and we, we can't touch back on that as adults, even looking back, we don't really remember what that felt like. Um, yeah. But brain studies have pointed out that uh, social rejection or not being able to engage in a social setting in the way that they think they should has the same effect on the brain as physical, as high levels of physical pain. So that, that ah, like dramatic response to not being allowed to do something or to losing their phone is actually what the brain is saying to that teen is happening. Yeah. Wow. You know, I, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, how, how the brain works and how we react and how we, you know, we, we, uh, you know, how our emotions kind of take control over our lives. And if we don't really understand our emotions or we don't deal with them in the right way, you know, chaos can occur both mentally, physically, you know, and it can affect our entire lives, you know, and, and you even mentioned about, um, you know, sexual abuse and how that's so prevalent in our society, you know, and I would think too, that that's, that's a, a it, first of all, the experience itself, is, is horrid but then you have you know then you have to go through life and then you have to be able to have relationships with people and how do you have relationships with people either friends 
or, you know, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a partner? And then, you know, how do you have a, you know, how, that trust factor? You know, are you, do you build a wall up your entire life and then nobody can get near you? You know, those communication skills, you know, there's so many factors that go into it. You know, um, when you deal with patients, you know, or clients, you know, that have gone through sexual abuse, you know, what are some of the things that, you know, you feel are beneficial that could help somebody who's had such a traumatic experience? Uh, it's it's different for everybody. So it's such an individualized experience and healing process um, that honestly, the one thing that I see that's beneficial is seeing that individual as more than a quote unquote victim or a quote unquote survivor. I actually wrote about this in a blog post not too long ago um, on, on April Flower Ponders. And we have a tendency in the field to really like labels and a tendency in humanity to really like labels. And so after somebody's experienced a, a sexual trauma, they're labeled a victim. And then right. as they start their healing process, they're labeled a survivor. And then in some spaces, um, as they're as they're moving through, they're labeled a thriver. But all of those limit who that person is because that, then their entire self is tied to this one incident or the series of incidences. And so as parents and caregivers and therapists and educators or just the community as a whole, um, if we can show and, and be open to seeing that person as um, more than just that one experience, I see that tends to lead to better results for that individual than just narrowly focusing on that experience and allowing them the space to self-define um, themselves within that experience and outside of that experience. I think that's great advice, you know, and when you have these communities of care, like do you, in that community of care, you work with the parents and you work with the, the, the children or the, the tweens or the teens and is it, is it, is it a group session where that, you know, or is it, most beneficial one-on-one -on -one? because sometimes you know I think kids are afraid to 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 really let out their emotions you know especially in front of their parents and sometimes the the parents you know they they have their own emotions going on about the situations and you know so when you have a community care and you're not you know you don't want to point the finger anymore and you want to kind of bond together as one you know what are some of the the ways that you can develop a community of care and in learn to have that, those healthy established relationships? So I like to start with talking to the child by themselves and giving them the space to express um, what they want to communicate with their caregivers or their teachers or their therapists um, so that we have a good idea of what message are we trying to communicate? Because we know that no matter how good they are at communicating, other people, nobody's going to hear exactly what you're trying to communicate. So trying to really narrow that message down. Um, if it's a parent who is heightened emotionally, I'll meet with them separately as well and let them vent all the feelings out to me so that yeah. when the child shares what they're trying to communicate with the child, they get the emotionally regulated version of the parent, the one that already dealt with all the feelings. Um, yeah. And then I mediate as needed, um, but for the most part, if I have them lower, they can do it themselves. Um, and I'll do the same thing in schools. I'll join parents for IEP meetings um, to help teachers understand the child, because again, the parent gets heightened and the teachers become defensive. And so I, I do kind of a, a similar thing with the with the teachers. Um, and honestly, if if there's grandparents or babysitters or older siblings, anybody that's in that child's life on a regular basis, I, I try to include them in these discussions as well. Again, so that everybody that child is interacting with, anybody, particularly those that have power in the child's life, are able to see the child through the lens of this was the trauma they experienced. So when they, uh, when you're asking them to do something and they're ignoring you, not actually ignoring you. They're in fight, flight, freeze mode and nothing is coming in. So give them a few minutes and then come back and try again. I like that. I like that a lot. 
I think I think that that's good because some parents can be persistent and they want results right away and they don't they don't let up. They they keep they keep houndering and houndering and houndering and they do that. I notice also in their adult life too with other people in their workforce life in their in their family life, you know. They they right away when an issue arises, they have to get a solution, have to get a solution. And people have to realize that solutions don't happen overnight and sometimes it takes a while, I think, you know, to really get to that point where those emotions are you know understood and you are dealt with those emotions and then you overcome those emotions and you can move forward but it's not it's not usually a boom 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 it's you know it, it takes time you know so what's your your um your uh your own uh idea about that I think that the boom, 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 if we look at it the same way we're looking at um, the developmental piece, it makes sense. Somewhere in their life, hammering in on something got them the results that they wanted. It makes them feel like less anxious because they have they need that they need that solution to feel better. And so helping them to understand the function of the boom, 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 and helping them to to see why that's so important and maybe to see um, generationally how that worked well or didn't work well in their family of origin will help yeah. them to maybe lessen it up a little bit with their own child. Right. Right. I think those are great ideas. Um, you know, when you have, you have a lot of different services that you provide and, and you mention a lot of them, you have like several different websites. Can you tell us a little bit about the different services that you provide that are, you feel are very helpful to a lot of families and, and, and school systems and so forth? Yeah, so through Apoclar Ponders, which is at apoclarponders.org, um, you can see just my ponderings where I think about things and write about them in a blog. I homeschool my kids, so there's some of that in there as well. Um, and then, there, like I said, there are a couple of free downloads there around talking to your child about grief, talking to your child about um, you know when the news has difficult things on the news, how to have those conversations. Um, and through there, you can also access me for parent consultations or for assessments. Um, oftentimes, children are unable to access the services they need through school, um, yeah. or parents are just wondering, what is going on with my child? This feels so different than my other child or so different than their friends. Um, yeah. We can talk about what kinds of assessments might be beneficial. Um, and then I also do these school-based audits on well-being um, so you can access that through my website as well if you're interested in those kinds of services. And that can look different from school to school. Um, so I really talk with the administrators about what problems are they seeing or what are they trying to build and then work with them um, together to do that. Uh, and then on the nonprofit side, which is foundationsentinel.org, um, I really focus on the aftercare and the prevention pieces of child sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. Most of my team is focused more on the recovery or the removal of children. And so mm -hmm. I look at what happens to the children after they're removed. How can we ensure that the places they're put after removal are actually beneficial to them? Because the numbers suggest that 85 to 90% of people that are removed from an exploitative situation end up back inside one within a year. And those numbers are very high for teens. Um, so I'm looking at how do we best support this child and their caregivers to ensure that doesn't happen. Um, yeah. And on the, on the other side of that is, again, building a prevention space. So if you're interested in supporting that, we're trying to raise some funding to create an online program that uh, builds prevention through psychoeducation for parents and children. Um, and the, the cool thing about it is that to move on to the next lesson or the next step, the parent and the child have to interact about the topic. So not only are we building awareness, but we're building or strengthening the muscles to have those kinds of difficult conversations. Yeah, because those conversations can be definitely um, really diff difficult to ob obtain because you have, you know, when you have heated emotions and you have different viewpoints a lot could be, you know, um, it could either go a good way or a bad way. And a lot of times when when every when both sides are heated, if, if you don't have someone interacting and slowing down the conversation or making people see the other person's perspective, 
you know, it, it, it may not go good. So it's always good to have that third person there, that person who's, you know, keeping everything, you know, um, on, on a one level, you know, situation. And, uh, you know, so something like that is definitely very, very good, very, very good. And, 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 and it is sad because when a lot of children get taken out of their homes and they get go into forced care and they go into other homes, you know, um, there is a high rate, you know, and a lot of these, you know, the, you have a, a small rate of people who learn from from it, but then you have also a high rate um, of people just doing it for the wrong reasons. And these children come into these homes and some of these homes are just as dysfunctional as the homes they had left. And it's sad, you know, um, but, you know, with the, with the proper care and the proper people and, and what you're doing right now for the community care, you know, um, having that guidance and having that care, all you need is one person. People don't realize, but you just need one person to come into your life that they could trust, that they, you know, they can learn from and that person helps them in some way or fashion and their life could change completely, do a total turnaround. And, you know, that's all you really, you really need, you know, and it's, it's pretty amazing. Now, in, when you look at today's conversation, if you had to pull out some um, pointers, what are some things, you know, that you'd like to emphasize about today's conversation to the listeners? I think the biggest take home that I want anybody that works with children, parents, or educators to know is that good enough is good enough. I think that we try so hard to be the best and we don't yeah. realize um, that in that pursuit of doing things perfect based on whatever internet article we read most recently says is perfect, yeah. um, mm -hmm. we're actually missing out on the chances to just build that, as you pointed out, that trusting relationship, because that means more than doing it right all the time. Being a safe haven for a child is the yeah. best thing any adult could ever do. And that's what the community of care is built upon. I love it. I love it. You know, this has been an amazing conversation. Before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to touch base on that you you we haven't discussed in this conversation? Um, no, I think that this is great for talking about um, parenting and 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 just supporting children. So thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. I think it's so important. I think today's conversation is so needed because there are so many parents out there that, you know, one, you know, they may, they may have problems in the home and they just don't know where to go. They don't know how to solve them. And two, you have pa parents that are in, in hard situations and, you know, they, they are hard on, them, on themselves, you know, maybe could have, would have, should have, you know, and, you know, we can't really beat ourselves over the head. We have to just, with the circumstances that we have, we have to try to make Make the best of it and you know trying to do the best and also if you if you realize that you've made mistakes along the way it doesn't hurt to you know to go to that person and say look you know i tried my best i did it this way because and if, if, if you're not happy with this or this hurt you in any way, you know, I'm really sorry. But at that moment, you know, it was the best I could do. And and, you know, I think sometimes just a person, you know, hear another person recognize that they had pain and, you know, and that they're sorry that if they caused that action, you know, that's all they need, you know, because I think sometimes kids and sometimes tweens and, and even adults, you know, you want to just, you know, have, have to be recognized that you know, that person acknowledges their mistakes, you know, and they're sorry or a hug or anything, you know, and that's all they're looking for, something simple. And unfortunately, in our in our community, a lot of times people you'll hear teens and you'll hear families, members, they never said, I'm sorry, you know, so then we go back into the psychology. Well, you don't need them to feel say, I'm sorry, as long as you forgive them and you look back at where they came from and why they did the things they did, you know, but it is nice when, you know, if a parent parent is capable of doing that, you know, and realizing their mistakes and being able to actually have the courage to tell their child, I made some mistakes, I'm sorry, you know, let's try to make it better for the future, you know, and understanding each other's needs and wants and, and working towards a, a more productive future. And I think that's so important, you know, and some, you know, it doesn't make us less of a person if we admit that we were wrong. And I think parents, you know, have to realize that too. You know, let's take our egos down a, a notch and really be, understand that we're just human beings and human beings aren't perfect. Yeah, there's actually a lot of power to that validation side too. Even if you don't feel like you can say I'm sorry, just acknowledging how somebody else feels 
is something we don't do enough, particularly in the parenting space. Um, so just saying, you're really mad at me. I can tell you're really angry is so validating because it helps a child feel seen. You're not yeah. telling them it's okay to, to throw things when they're angry. You're just acknowledging that they're angry. You're right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Ashley, this has been an amazing conversation. I hope you'll come back on the show and then we can talk some more because, you know, you, you cover a lot of different things with your nonprofit organization, with your, you know, with your community um, care for children, and you do a couple other things and it's all based around, you know, family and, and being able to really improve our society as a whole. So I hope you'll come back. You've been amazing. Your conversation conversation is amazing. And I, you know, I'm, I'm really glad and honored to have you on the show. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. You have a great day. You too. Thanks.